So I want to begin by reminding you all of something you already know, um, a reality that most of you probably follow in the news, or maybe you know it on a visceral level for you see it happening around you in real time. Uh, in 2013, Typhoon Haiyan made landfall in the Philippines. It was the strongest tropical cyclone ever recorded on our planet, uh, with wind speeds of up to 200 miles per hour. Not even the most callous observers were left unmoved by the images that circulated around the world that month. It was destruction on a vast scale. Whole cities and towns were laid waste. Six million people were displaced and thousands disappeared. Two years later, bodies were still being retrieved from the wreckage. As this was happening, the UN Climate Change Conference was being held in Poland at exactly the same time. The delegate from the Philippines, a soft-spoken man by the name of Yeb Sano, gave an emotional speech that went viral on social media. Super Typhoon Haiyan made landfall in my family's hometown and the devastation is staggering, he said. I struggle to find words for the images that we see. I struggle to find words to describe the losses we have suffered from this cataclysm. Up to this hour, I agonize while waiting for word as to the fate of my very own family. We must stop calling events like these natural disasters, he said. It's the result of inequality and the pursuit of so-called economic growth that dominates our world. In a voice choked by tears, but bolstered by rage, he continued, what my country is going through is a result of this extreme climate, uh, climate event as madness. The climate crisis is madness. I speak for my delegation, but more than that, I speak for the countless people who will no longer be able to speak for themselves, having perished in this storm. And it's not just superstorms. It's not just the Philippines. Draw to mind the images that you've seen over the past few years. Right? Think of the fires that blazed through Australia recently where people took refuge on beaches as their world went up in flames. Think of the eerie dark orange that smeared the skies of the US West Coast this last summer as fires scorched parched earth from California to Washington. Our planet is changing before our very eyes and we are already grieving. Right now, we're only at one degree above normal temperatures. On our present trajectory, we're on track to hit three or four degrees this century. Humans have never existed on a planet uh, that's like that before. And climate scientists say that such a world is incompatible with organized civilization as we know it. Without radical action, at least 1 billion people will be displaced in our lifetime as parts of the planet become uninhabitable. Average yields of staple food crops will collapse by up to 30%, triggering famines in many parts of the world. It doesn't take much to grasp that this is, uh, this is likely to cause unprecedented social and political upheaval. But climate change is not the only ecological problem we face. The crisis is much broader than this. Uh, there's deforestation to the point where many forest ecosystems like the Amazon are on the verge of collapse. There's soil depletion, whereby industrial monoculture is destroying topsoils faster than they can be replenished. There's biodiversity loss with rates of species extinction happening up to 1000 times faster than prior to the Industrial Revolution. On our present trajectory, 30 to 50% of existing species are projected to disappear by the end of this century. Our non-human relatives are being systematically exterminated. So what's causing all of this? Well, we, so we often refer to this as the Anthropocene, right? An era where human impact is fundamentally reshaping our planets. But this leads us to believe that humans are the problem. Uh, but the language of the Anthropocene has it totally wrong. It's not humans as such that are causing this crisis. Rather, it's our economic system, namely capitalism. Now, let me clarify what I mean by capitalism here, because there can be misunderstandings. Normally, when people think about capitalism, they associate it with markets, trade, businesses, and so on. But this isn't exactly accurate. Capitalism is a system that's only about 500 years old. Markets, trade, and even businesses existed for thousands of years before this, and they are innocence enough on their own. What makes capitalism distinctive is that it's organized around and dependent on perpetual growth. It's the first and only economic system in human history that is intrinsically expansionary. If it doesn't grow, it collapses into crisis, triggering recessions, people lose their jobs, poverty goes up, inequality rises, and so on. 
So we have to keep the, the gross domestic product, the GDP, growing at a rate of 3% per year. And this might seem like a small increments because we're used to thinking of growth in linear terms. But remember, this is a compounding exponential function. And during the COVID pandemic, we've all learned how dangerous exponential functions can become. Now, this might not be a problem if GDP was just plucked out of thin air, but it's not. It requires resources and energy. So the more the economy grows, the more resource and energy it chews up. And this is what's driving ecological breakdown. Yeb Sano was right. So I wanna, I wanna show you just a couple of slides here to illustrate um, a few key points, if I can. Uh, so this is um, a graph that shows you two lines. One is uh, global resource use in, in, in black there. And the other line is global GDP, okay? Now what, what this demonstrates is a very tight coupling between uh, GDP growth and resource use. There was talk a couple of decades ago about the possibility of green growth, whereby GDP would keep going up while resource use fell, but that hasn't happened. In fact, resource use has been rising at a faster pace than GDP. Um, and this gives you a sense for kind of where we're at globally right now. The red line you see is what scientists consider to be the safe, sustainable boundary for resource use. And as you can see, we blew past that boundary in the 1990s and things have only accelerated since then. This is what is, is driving the ecological breakdown that we're seeing all around us, okay? Now, crucially, um, not all nations are equally responsible for this crisis. Um, here we have uh, the per capita sustainable threshold in red here, and low, low income countries over here, and low, lower middle income countries right here consume very little actually, only about two to three tons of stuff per person. Um, whereas high income nations, over here, consume vastly in excess of the sustainable boundary, um, about 28 tons of material stuff per person per year. Um, uh, high income nations are, uh, are almost the sole drivers of the ecological breakdown that our planet is experiencing, um, even though most of it harms the global south, the poor countries of the, of the global south most. Something is true also of, of climate change. Um, this graph shows you uh, who has contributed most to excess emissions um, over the past couple hundred years. And what we see is that the USA is single-handedly responsible for 40% of the emissions that are causing climate breakdown, the EU for 29%, the global North uh, as a group for 92%, and the, in all of the regions of the global South, Africa, Asia, and Latin America are responsible for only 8% of those emissions. And yes, the, the consequences of climate breakdown affect the global South um, most brutally. So what we're dealing with here is also um, a crisis that has col clear colonial dimensions that we need to pay attention to. So how do we resolve this? What do we do? Well, we, we know what has to happen. Um, global emissions have to uh, fall by 50% uh, by in the next 10 years um, and reach zero by the middle of the century in order for us to stay under 1.5 degrees. Crucially, because high income nations have contributed the vast majority of historical emissions, they have to do it much faster, reaching zero by 2030, uh, right at the latest, in order to be just about that. Um, okay, uh, just give me a second to go, to go back here. So um, the question is, is it possible for us to do this? Is it possible for us to transition to 100% renewable energy and reverse ecological breakdown in the short time that we have left? Fortunately, the answer is yes, but not if we continue to pursue economic growth at the usual rates. In fact, we need a completely different approach. High income nations, as we've seen, need to significantly reduce their use of resources and energy. So this is what um, we refer to as degrowth. And it's an idea that's been getting a lot of steam among scientists and social movements in the past few years. Degrowth is a planned reduction of resource and energy use in high income nations designed to bring the economy back into balance with the living world in a safe, just, and equitable way. And the core claim of degrowth is that high-income nations don't need more growth to deliver uh, flourishing lives and high levels of well-being for all. So what does this look like in reality? Well, the dominant assumption in economics right now is that all sectors of the economy must grow all the time, regardless of whether we actually need them. Uh, but this is a socially and ecologically irrational way to run an economy. Instead, we should have an open conversation about what parts of the economy we actually want to expand, things like public health care, renewable energy, public transportation, and so on, and what parts are clearly destructive and need to be scaled down. 
things like the arms industry, SUVs, private jets, fast fashion, industrial beef, advertising, and so on. Um, of course, the reason we don't do this is because of the specter of unemployment. If we scale down, if we take the rational step of scaling down less necessary parts of the economy, there'll be fewer jobs. And obviously we need jobs in order to survive in our economic system. In, in fact, the, ma the main reason we all line up behind the growth agenda is because we always need more jobs. But this is not the only solution. An alternative approach is to shorten the working week and distribute necessary labor more evenly. We don't need more jobs, we need a better distribution of work. And the exciting thing is that shortening the working week has been shown to have significant positive impact on people's health, happiness, and well being. We also need to significantly reduce inequality. We're often told that we need growth to create more income and improve people's lives. But in rich countries like Britain, the problem isn't that there's a deficit of income. The problem is that it's all captured at the top. The key thing to grasp here is that we can solve our social problems right now simply by sharing what we already have more fairly rather than plundering the earth for more. At the same time, we need to expand universal public services, not just healthcare and education, but transportation, affordable housing, energy, and internet, so that everyone can have access to the resources they need to live good lives without requiring high levels of private income in order to do so. So the exciting thing is that it's 100% possible for us to, to, to do this, to scale down excess resource use, um, take pressure off of the global south, reverse ecological damage, while at the same time building a flourishing society, one that is more just and more caring. But it requires breaking free from the shackles of growthism. And that is difficult to do because for decades we've been taught that growth is the only way. It's so deeply embedded in our ideology that we rarely think to question it. But question it we must. And when we do, exciting new possibilities open up. So in this book, Less is More, my goal is to take readers on a journey, telling the story of how we came to see the world as we do today and what a different way of being might look like. Thanks very much.